Usually we think we can instantly tell when a Pokemon is going to be good. And in fairness, most of the time we can. For instance, from the first day of Generation 4, there was no doubt whatsoever about Garchomp. However, sometimes it takes time, metagame development, and most importantly, player experimentation for the value of previously underseen Pokemon to become recognized. And as a result of players continuing to play them and explore their many possibilities, these old generation metagames have often changed to the point of being unrecognizable to their position at the end of the current generation, which makes the term old generation as a signifier of stability somewhat obsolete. It goes to show that just because a generation ceases to be current does not mean all options in it have been exhausted. Now, part of this comes from underrated sets, combinations, and in-battle strategies, but another part of the reason is because of the Pokemon like those of this list. The Pokemon that were discovered to be excellent in their respective OU metagames long, long after the tier had ceased to be simply OU and became more known by its generation instead. These are the Pokemon that were found to be great much later on, and we're ordering these Pokemon based on approximately how long they took to be discovered as top tier threats from shortest to longest. And just to be clear, we are not talking about Pokemon who received some new things in the next generation and became better in the previous generation. We are talking about how these Pokemon rose to prominence in the same generation. So without further ado, here are five Pokemon who became good years later in singles. And also, here is a top 5 VPN because this video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Surfshark is an app and browser extension that allows you to place your computer or phone virtually in any country as if you're actually there. Surfshark has 3200 plus servers in 65 countries. And by using Surfshark to connect to servers in other countries, you can get access to content that is normally region locked. If you have a streaming service like Netflix and there's a show you really want to watch, but you don't happen to live in that country, with just one click of a button, you get super Netflix. Of course, being a VPN, Surfshark encrypts your data and keeps it safe when connected to it no matter where you are. When I travel, sometimes I need to check how much I'm spending, but I ain't trying to leak my login information of my bank to some random lurker on a public Wi-Fi. I turn on Surfshark VPN, and now I can check that I spent way too much money at the gift shop safely. Surfshark is also the only VPN service to let you use one account on unlimited devices. So now I can have it on my phone, my tablet, my laptop, and both of my editing computers. So if you want a sick VPN and also support the channel to help us produce more content, you can use my promo code or check the link in the description to get Surfshark VPN at 83% off and three extra months for free. Generation 4 has just ended as the main generation. Lead Machamp is dominant, Subroost Toxic Zapdos is stalling out entire teams, Choice Ban Tyranitar is spamming stone edges left and right, Stall and Offense alike laid down crippling toxic spikes. What to do? Needle Queen, that's what. It had seen sparse usage on specific stall teams before, but it was far from a metagame staple. At least, until it burst onto the scene and showed it wasn't specialized or specific, but instead an excellent all-around Pokemon. DPP Needle Queen is perhaps the most notable Pokemon on this list because it didn't rise to a place in OU from BL or UU. It rose all the way from NU. Its traits were excellent. Its outstanding typing made it a terrific buffer against all sorts of damage, both direct and indirect. It was resistant to Stealth Rock, immune to Sandstorm, and wasn't just unaffected by Toxic Spikes. It absorbed them. Plus, it was as unafraid of Thunder Wave as it was of Toxic. On the other side, its unique set of resistances gave it a coveted trait of resisting both fighting and rock while being immune to electric as well. Plus, with Poison Point, it actually punished Machamp spamming Dynamic Punch or Flygon spamming U-Turn, usually moves that were nigh riskless. It was a nearly perfect counter to Lucario and Zapdos at the same time. It could tweak its EVs to a more specially defensive spread that made it more apt in a fashion akin to specially defensive Hippolyton at devouring hits from Heatran, Life Orb Gengar, and Mixed Dragonite. What did Nidoqueen do with all this walling prowess? Well, while the first reaction was hazards, it could set up Stealth Rock and or Toxic Spikes. With its terrific longevity accentuated by Protect, helping it maximize accumulated Black Sludge recovery, Needle Queen excelled at outlasting offensive teams, who, in addition to struggling to hurt it, were usually more susceptible to passive damage than it. The Pokemon that could threaten Needle were few, and
and they usually didn't care for the passive damage Needle Queen and friends piled on. However, Needle Queen wasn't just a passive wall slash hazard machine. It could actually hit back with its superb move pool. Usually, it used Ice Beam for Dragonite, Flygon, Gliscor, and Zapdos, but it could also use Flamethrower sometimes. It even used Thunderbolt to catch Gyarados off guard. It could dip into a more esoteric territory too, using Super Fang. It could mess with other stall teams with Taunt. It could phase with Roar. It could bounce back big physical attacks with Counter. Needle Queen's move pool and walling capabilities were so good, some teams didn't even need it to set hazards up for them, proving it really wasn't just the thing that got T-Spikes. Needle Queen's favorite partner, by the way, another lower tier Pokemon that excelled at outlasting the opponent, Clefable. The Needle Clef duel became the backbone of a new wave of stall that wound up proving skeptics wrong and defining the metagame itself. It was the first time that a lower tier duel wound up dominating OUs, paving the way for the Doug Clef combo later, and it's crazy that it happened twice in the same generation. With Generation 4 OU being dominated as it was by Heatran, Tyranitar, and Jirachi, it was no wonder that Doug Shiro would have at least some sort of use in the tier. Plus, it didn't just trap and destroy the very best, most important Pokemon in the tier, though that would have been enough in and of itself. It also removed other staples like Breloom, Blissey, Infernape, Metagross, and sometimes even the likes of Gengar and Starmie. As such, Doug Shiro threatened the trap and KO of a huge portion of most teams. And not only that, it was also great at finishing off weakened Pokemon hit neutrally by Earthquake. For example, once something as bulky as Machamp or offensive Suicune of all things dipped to around or just below half health, Dugtrio could come in and finish it off. However, though Dugtrio's potential in the tier was widely acknowledged and it did have a small niche, it didn't much go beyond that. Dugtrio had long been a superstar in Yu Yu because the tier was much weaker as a whole, and thus it could switch right into several of its most prominent targets, most notably Registeel. In OU, it was far more difficult for it to do so. Furthermore, several of the would-be targets often ran sets that Dugtrio would have a difficult time trapping. Dragon Dance Tyranitar most commonly ran Shukaberry, as did many variants of offensive Calmine Jirachi. Jirachi also commonly ran Choice Scarf, as did Heat Ran. Furthermore, Dugtrio teams tended to have gaping, exploitable defensive holes. Now, this didn't prevent Doug from being used on occasion on different styles of teams and to quite decent success. There was the style of dual-pronged electric-type offensive attack. There was using Doug to reinforce a stall team's defenses in an idea taken from Gen 3 OU, and there were all-out trap teams where Doug paired with Magnezone. These teams were generally solid, but their many apparent flaws meant they didn't see consistent use, and thus didn't have too solid an impact on the metagame. Eventually, Latias returned to OU, and players began looking at Doug Shio more seriously, as Lati was an excellent Pokemon with few answers, most of whom were vulnerable to Doug. At first, the flaws remained. It was hard to get Doug Shio onto the field without high-risk double switching, and the teams with it had massive vulnerabilities. Abilities. For example, after Doug Shio trapped a target, Dragonite or Gyarados would get a free Dragon Dance, and that spelled trouble. Doug Shio teams attempted to address this, but investing too much in Revenge Killers meant there wasn't enough Doug Shio enabled offensive threat going on. However, all this changed once Doug Shio started being paired with another Yu Yu Pokemon, Clefable. Specifically, its Calm Mind variant. Calm Mind Clefable's Bolt Beam coverage in conjunction with its incredible bulk with a bold nature and max defense not only allowed it to check the two flying type dragon dancers that attempted to turn the tides on a Dugtrio trap, but also made it a perfect sweeping Pokemon facilitated by Dugtrio. It was almost as simple as this. Whatever Dugtrio wouldn't trap, Clefable would beat. And what would beat Clefable? Doug would trap. But what of the Herculean, arduous task of switching Dugtrio in? While previous teams had taken a leaf out of Yu book and relied on U-turn users to bypass Dugtrio's frailty. Before, it was Celebi, but Celebi had lost a bit of its luster in this new meta game, and instead, U-turn Zapdos took its place. Zapdos baited in Tyranitar and bulky Heatran like almost nothing else, and easily removed them with a U-turn with Dugtrio. Double switching to Dugtrio became quite easy too. Latias forced switches so easily that switching to Dugtrio as its check came in became almost as effortless as clicking Draco Meteor. But what of Dugtrio's other problem? The fact that some targets used sets that it couldn't beat. Well, that's exactly why it paired so beautifully with bold Calm Mind Clefable. Physically defensive Jirachi that survived 
revived Dugshio wouldn't actually be able to beat Clefable. Ditto for Scarf Heatran. Both Clefable survived its explosion with ease. This was what made Dugshio into a real problem. Before, it was inconsistent because the Pokemon it was enabling, like Cresselia, weren't such instant game enders. And the teams it was surrounded by were quite vulnerable to either not being threatening enough or being punished by opposing threats. Bold Clefable changed this. You needed the one turn punish for Gyarados or Dragonite to try and regain ground against the forceful nature of Dugtrio, since it was so threatening against such huge portions of OU teams. And Clefable removed that. Of course, Dugtrio made plenty of other Pokemon threatening as well, from Zapdos to Latias to Jirachi to Heatran. That's really what made Dugtrio too much for the tier. Once it was figured out, it made what were already the best Pokemon around downright impossible to stop. And so Dugtrio went from a niche UU pick, sometimes seen to catch a tournament opponent off guard, to being banned from OU, literally a decade after Generation 4 ended. Contrary to popular belief, Generation 4 Clefable was not a product of its popularity in Generation 6, like its fellow UU and future partner in crime, Dugtrio. It already had slight niches and tournament success during the current generation. It started really picking up Steve while Generation 5 was current, and this extended usage coincided with the release of Generation 6. Though of course, Clefable's excellence in Generation 6 certainly didn't hurt its place in Generation 4, it just increased awareness of something that had already been around for years. Gen 6's main contribution to Gen 4 Clefable was not Clefable itself, but the use of the buffed knockoff on everything that got it. This prompted a surge in knockoff usage in previous gens, and indeed wound up becoming one of Gen 4 Clefable's best weapons. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Why had Clefable been seeing flashes of experimentation and usage amongst top players as far back as the Platinum Era, let alone Heart Gold and Soul Silver? Magic Guard's immunity to any and all passive damage, of course. This was especially relevant in those lengthy periods of Generation 4, which were utterly dominated by stall and semi-stall teams that were completely reliant on passive damage. Their popularity and effectiveness continued after the generation ended. Many players bemoaned the strength and prominence of entry hazards. They disliked the protracted, difficult lengths one had to go to if they wanted to rapid spin those hazards away. In this war on hazard stacking, Clefable offered an option that was much easier to use. It didn't care if the opponent had Stealth Rock, 3 layers of Spikes, 2 layers of Toxic Spice, and Sandstorm active while spamming Leech Seed. It ignored all of that and could threaten to sweep with Calm Mind. Indeed, it was doing this well over half a decade before it was paired with Dugtrio. Clefable didn't just have to be a Calm Minder though. It also established itself as one of the most infuriating support Pokemon in the metagame. It wasn't just immune to passive damage, it was excellent at taking hits from metagame staples like Zapdos, and could support its team with Thunder Wave and the aforementioned knockoff. It was also an excellent stealth rocker since it still dominated the best, most common spinner in the tier, Starmie. Clefable didn't hit hard, but it proved that you did didn't have to do that in order to be insanely difficult to switch into. Knockoff alone crippled pretty much everything that wasn't an already activated Toxic or Breloom. It was offensive even while defensive. It could even use something like Encore to counter pokes it otherwise couldn't, like Substitute Kama and Jirachi. Eventually, complaints about entry hazards disappeared and were instead replaced with complaints about how unkillable Clefable was. Clefable wasn't just good against Stall, it became the new face of Stall and completely changed how those teams were used. Taking their cues from Clefable, they became less about rapid spinning away opposing spikes and more about ignoring opposing spikes altogether. Clefable also offered much needed respite against another aspect of DPP that was difficult to handle and possessed limited counterplay options. Status. It didn't fear burns from the Rotom appliances, Toxic from Blissey or Gliscor, or either one from Heatran. It didn't even fear Para from pokes like Zapdos because, in Generation 4 only, Magic Guard provided an immunity to full paralysis. This prompted another amusing series of changing complaints from the player base. First, Paralysis was too much. Then Clefable was too much because it was immune to full Paralysis. Clefable could really do it all. It commonly dipped into its vast move pool to make effective use of excellent tools like Wish, but at its core, it was just a great metagame changing Pokemon that rose from the depths of UU many years before it was paired with Dugtrio. And yes, some have expressed a desire to ban Clefable itself. It seems unlikely it will happen, but from UU to players wanting to ban you in OU, Clefable's really done it. Also, through its excellence in OU, Clefable has even found itself a small but excellent niche in Gen 4 Ubers.
Doug Shiro's trapping holds back several of the most dangerous offensive threats in advance, such as Heracross, Tyranitar, Metagross, Jirachi, Raikou, and Celebi. As Doug Shiro's reach is so wide, it's not uncommon to see games where it picks off several members of the opponent's team. It's difficult to truly punish, and even more difficult to forcibly remove. One method of doing so is to use your own Doug Shiro. No, not relying on the speed tie, but by baiting the opponent's Doug Shiro with Heracross or Celebi, forcing them into Aerial Lace or Hidden Power Bugs so your own Doug Shiro can survive the hit and successfully trap it. While a good strategy, this isn't always reliable. What if there was a way to counter trap opposing Doug Shiro even if it locked into Earthquake, as it loves to do? Enter Porygon 2. It would trace Doug Shiro's arena trap and with its excellent physical bulk, easily shrug off Earthquake, allowing a reliable counter trap. This enabled the aforementioned terrifying offensive threats like little else. It was mainly seen on Combine spam teams and it revitalized the style to the point where it rose to OU at a time when post-generational tiering changes didn't really exist. It was very much the first of its kind in this vein, which has thoroughly earned its spot on this list. Another thing that made Porygon 2 so good was that it wasn't just good against Doug Shiro. It was also a fantastic utility Pokemon on defense. It was an outstanding counter to Salamence and was generally apt at taking most offensive hits, which not only gave the offensive teams it was on a much needed backbone against threats like Starmie, but also allowed it to support its team further by spreading Thunder Wave. And so Porygon 2's enabling of offensive threats gave it a unique legitimate place in Gen 3 OU. And as always, before we go into number one, we have some honorary mentions. RBY Jolteon rose as a Zapdos counter that was an effective electric type threat itself, meaning it didn't possess the weakness to Starmie, Lapras, and Cloyster that the similarly Zapdos countering Rhydon did. Jolteon also possessed the high crit rate in the tier. Finally, GSC Moltres used a sunny day set with Charcoal to do what no other special attacker could do in Gen 2, at least not with just one turn of setup. It two-hit KO'd Snorlax with the slightest chip damage. Sunny Day also had the benefit of dropping the accuracy of Opposing Thunders to 50%. For the longest time, serious Gen 3 OU play was stunningly devoid of fire types. Then, a phoenix rose from the ashes of BL and changed that with blazing ferocity. Moltres reduced much of OU to embers with effortless ease through its uniquely useful defensive traits that allowed it to maximize its devastating offensive potential. It is entirely unique in that it not only one-hit KO's Metagross, which is nearly impossible to do for anything in advanced OU, but it actually switches into its moves too, as opposed to something like Blaziken or Choice Band Flygon. Once it hits the field, which isn't hard for it to do, Moltres attacks with the strongest fire stab in the game, a fire stab which hits a huge portion of common, top-tier Pokemon in advanced OU super effectively, including Skarmory, Jirachi, Celebi, and many more, such as the aforementioned Metagross. It also possesses an excellent speed stab for the tier, which gives it a jump on significant portions of teams. And you can't just pack a fire resist and be safe either, because Moltres also comes equipped with a swap Swampert ruining Hidden Power Grass that also slams Tyranitar quite hard. Additionally, it comes with one of the most terrifying moves in the game, Will-O-Wisp, which accentuates its offensive assault by utterly ruining would-be checks like Flygon, Salamence, and Aerodactyl. But what about Blissey, which doesn't mind its attacks and has natural cure for burn? Well, Moltres not only has the excellent trait of hovering above spikes itself, which allows it to repeatedly batter away at bulky teams relying on them, but it is also an excellent spikes abuser as they push crucial damage against Suicune, Tyranitar, and Blissey. Sometimes Moltres even runs Roar to really maximize their output. Moltres single-handedly roasted a ton of teams. For example, many Magneton offense teams, which had a habit of stacking fire-weak Pokemon alongside the already fire-weak Magneton, such as Heracross and Metagross, that were previously viable, now found themselves entirely eliminated from the metagame by virtue of being almost literally 6 0 by Moltres, completely unable to switch into to it and barely able to answer it at all. And so Moltres paved the way for fire type usage in OU and established itself as one of the most instantly dangerous Pokemon in the metagame. Thanks for watching everyone, and as always, if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to Full Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know what other new type of videos do you want to see? We got some really good suggestions from last time, but we'd like to hear more. And thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos, and thank you to everyone else watching as well.
and follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.